Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Gary Anandasangari. I'm the Member of Parliament for Scarborough Rouge Park. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered here on the traditional unceded lands of the Algonquin people. And I'm joined here by a number of people, Farida Dev, uh, who is a Canada Director for Human Rights Watch, Archana Ravichandra Deva, who is the Executive Director for People for Equality and Relief in Lanka, and Vinod Navajiva Nanda, who is the President uh, for Centre Communautaire Tamil de Quebec. In the midst of the most significant economic and political turmoil in the history of Sri Lanka, its parliament elected Ranil Vikramasinghe, a failed former prime minister, as its executive president. In doing so, the parliament of Sri Lanka failed to capture the calls by tens of thousands of protesters over the past several months in seeking change from successive corrupt and inept governments. The protesters had succeeded in forcing the resignations of Mahinda Rajapaksha as Prime Minister and Gotabaya Rajapaksha as President. Today, Gotabaya Rajapaksha is in Singapore and reportedly seeking safe passage to another country where he can evade justice for his role as Defence Secretary in 2009 when the Sri Lanka Armed Forces committed war crimes, crimes, in, crimes against humanity and genocide. Today, more than ever, there's an imperative to ensure that leaders who commit atrocities be held to account. The successive failures of the international community to consistently apply and abide by the international rules-based order has resulted in international impunity and allowed those like the Rajapaksha brothers to roam freely. I'm therefore asking our government to impose sanctions on both Gotabaya Rajapaksha and Mahinda Rajapaksha for their roles in atrocities committed in 2008 and 9. Together, they're responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands of people, the displacement of over 300,000 Tamils, the bombing of hospitals and no-fly zones, deliberately understating the population count, resulting in starvation due to reduced food aid provided by the UN, failing to account for the thousands of men and women who went missing, including combatants who surrendered under the Geneva Convention. Summarily executing Tamils, including 12-year-old Balachandran Prabhaharan, and the use of sexual violence and rape as weapons of war. Essentially, the Rajapakshas broke international law and must be held to account. I believe that countries like Canada must take decisive action. This past May, the Canadian Parliament passed a motion acknowledging the genocide of Tamils in Sri Lanka. Today, more than ever, Canada needs to lead and ensure that the Rajapakshas and others are held to account. In the meantime, I wrote to the Singaporean Foreign Affairs Minister Vivian Balakrishnan yesterday to express my disappointment in their decision to allow Gotabaya Rajapaksha and his family to enter the country. But now that he is in the country, I'm asking the government of Singapore to prosecute Gotabaya Rajapaksha under the principles of universal jurisdiction for the crimes he committed. In that regard, I reiterate the numerous calls of the United Nations High Commission for Human Rights, asking member states to exercise universal jurisdiction and prosecute those who committed atrocity crimes in Sri Lanka within their local jurisdiction. And finally, as the International Monetary Fund, World Bank, and the Asian Development Bank negotiate a fiscal bailout, Sri Lanka's disproportionate expendi expenditure on its military needs to be reined in, and the state reform to ensure that the underlying grievances of the Tamil people are addressed meaningfully, and that there is respect and adherence to the rule of law. As we mark the 39th anniversary of Black July, the anti-Tamil program, this week, I want to acknowledge the enormous pain and loss of the Tamil community. I want to acknowledge the brave mothers of the disappeared who have continued to seek answers for their sons and daughters for over four and a half years. These protesters have not received much attention or sadly, the solidarity from those prote protesting the current economic challenges. Their persistence is truly inspiring and their faith 
that justice will be served should guide us to do the right by them and all the survivors. Thank you. Farida. Good afternoon, and thank you, uh, Member Perlin and Sangari, for bringing us together today and for your ongoing leadership on this file. Human Rights Watch has worked on Sri Lanka for over three decades, documenting serious violations by both sides during the 26-year civil war, and since the war ended in 2009, how successive governments have committed human rights abuses and undermined independent institutions crucial for effective and transparent governance. It's clear that the current crisis has deep systemic roots and it will be vital for key stakeholders to address the underlining root causes by pressing for reform and strengthening the rule of law. Sri Lanka's new government should use the transfer of power to address the acute economic, political, and human rights problems that have been the focus of months of protest. While its international partners, like Canada, should insist that the new government tackle entrenched problems of corruption, inequity, and lack of accountability for past abuses. If a more stable government enjoying public legitimacy cannot be established, the risk of a humanitarian crisis and of greater violence and repression is very high. With that said, Canada should urgently call upon Sri Lanka's new president and authorities to respect human rights in resolving the political and economic crisis. Prime Minister Trudeau should urgently communicate to his Sri Lankan counterpart that abuses against protesters are unacceptable. He should also affirm that a stable government with public legitimacy is essential to address the urgent needs of Sri Lankans as well as the root causes of the current crisis. Ottawa should also press Sri Lankan authorities to investigate and prosecute official corruption and freeze any assets in Canada if they are suspected to have been obtained from corruption. Canada should also support programs by the IMF, the World Bank, and others which protect the Sri Lankan people from the worst effects of the economic crisis and which insist on governance reform and strong measures to tackle corruption. It's also critical that Canada support the renewal of an accountability effort at the United Nations Human Rights Council to collect, analyze, and preserve evidence of international crimes for future prosecutions. It's crucial that this mandate is renewed in September and Canada is well-placed to lead these efforts. Steps to advance accountability for international crimes in Sri Lanka will reduce the growing risk of further abuses. The Canadian government should ensure that the warning signs are heeded by taking concrete action now. Thank you. Archana. Hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me here to speak today. Um, thank you, uh, MP Ananda Sangri. My name is Archana Ravichandran Deva, and I am the Executive Director of People for Equality and Relief in Lanka, otherwise known as PEARL. As an advocacy and human rights organization, it is a key part of Pearl's mandate to promote justice and accountability for the mass atrocities committed in Sri Lanka by the Sri Lankan government, especially during the end of the armed conflict between the Sri Lankan state and the liberation tigers of Tamalila. 13 years ago, from 2008 to 2009, a tiny strip of land in Sri Lanka's northeastern shores saw immeasurable violence, amounting to credible allegations of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. The architects of the violence were the country's political and military leaders, including then President Mahinda Rajapaksa and then Defense Secretary, and until very recently, President. Gotabaya Rajapaksa. Under the orders of Gotabaya Rajapaksa and these other military and political leaders, hospitals were repeatedly and intentionally shelled by the Sri Lankan armed forces. Artillery was used in an indiscriminate and disproportionate fashion against civilians in so-called no-fire zones. 
and LTTE combatants, as well as Tamil civilians and children, were ordered to be executed in contravention of the laws of war. Thousands of Tamil civilians who surrendered alive into army custody were never heard from again, and their families have been continuously protesting for answers and accountability for over 1,900 days. Instead of facing accountability for their crimes, however, the Rajapaksas were able to hold the highest levels of political and military power in Sri Lanka over the last decade, concentrating immense power in the hands of one family. In fact, the current collapse of the Sri Lankan state and the dire humanitarian, economic, and political crisis on the island is directly tied to the lack of accountability and the culture of impunity that is pervasive in Sri Lanka. Today's elections, in which Ranil Wickremesinghe, a close ally of the Rajapaksas, emerged as president, ensures Sri Lanka will continue to fail to deliver accountability domestically for the Rajapaksas' genocidal campaign. For that reason, it is vital that the international community, including Canada, ensure accountability and justice for Tamils. One week ago, amidst widespread protests, Gotabaya Rajapaksa fled Sri Lanka and has reportedly obtained safe haven in Singapore. Now that he is no longer protected by immunity, he, as well as other alleged perpetrators of Sri Lanka's mass atrocities, must face justice and accountability. Sanctions are one important tool in the accountability toolbox, and we call on the Canadian government to sanction former President Gotabaya Rajapaksa, former President Mahinda Rajapaksa, and other key military and political leaders. Wherever these perpetrators of the world's worst crimes end up, countries should exercise universal jurisdiction to hold them to account in their national courts. We also urge Canada to pursue an action against Sri Lanka at the International Court of Justice and to request the International Criminal Court to explore opportunities to investigate and prosecute Sri Lanka's mass atrocities against Tamils. The time for justice is now. Thank you. Thank you, Archana and uh, Vinod. The early 80s saw an influx of Tamil asylum seekers looking to escape a genocide perpetrated by the Sri Lankan state. Today, tens of thousands of Tamils call Quebec home. The Quebec Tamil Community Centre, through the provision of services and access to resources, is dedicated to the support, development, and growth of both its community members, as well as social, cultural, and educational institutions within the community. The Centre's vision is to create an open space where members of the community can unite, heal, collaborate, and grow. Tamils are still awaiting justice for the mass atrocities committed by the Sri Lankan government under the, leader under the leadership of the Rajapaksa brothers. According to the UN and other international organizations, hundreds of thousands of Tamils were killed or made to disappear, and numerous Tamil women were sexually assaulted and raped by the Sri Lankan security forces in the final six months of the genocide. For a community living with this trauma, acknowledgement and recognition is an essential step in moving forward and healing. Over the last several weeks, the developments in Sri Lanka have shown the world, as well as their citizens of Sri Lanka, just how brutal a dictatorship the Rajapaksas have been leading at the expense of the country's future. Dans les dernières semaines, les manifestants ont réussi à forcer la démission de Mahinda Rajapaksa en tant que premier ministre et son frère, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, en tant que président au milieu de cette crise économique significative. L'ancien premier ministre a pris refuge à Singapour et cherche à s'enfuir vers un autre pays afin de s'échapper de son rôle de secrétaire à la défense en 2019, lorsque les armées sri lankaises ont exécuté des crimes contre l'humanité et ont commis un génocide. En effet, les deux frères sont responsables de la mort et la disparition des milliers de citoyens tamouls innocents, du déplacement de plus de 300 000 tamouls de leur patrie et une discrimination importante contre ces populations augmentée davantage leur souffrance. Encore aujourd'hui, plusieurs familles souffrent par la mort et la disparition de leurs proches. Les mères cherchent encore de la justice pour la souffrance de leurs enfants. 
Et Mahinder Rajapaksa et son frère sont responsables de ces nombreux crimes qui ont fait les lois internationales. En mai, Canada a enfin été le premier pays à adopter une mention reconnaissant le génocide des Tamouls. Toutefois, il est aussi important de ne pas laisser des criminels de guerre circuler librement dans d'autres pays sans le tenir responsable pour les crimes qu'ils ont commis. Donc, en tant que représentants de la communauté tamoule, nous offrons notre support à la demande de MP Gary Anna de Sangari pour que le gouvernement mette en place des restrictions contre les Rajapaksa. Let Canada continue to be a safe haven for refugees and provide them opportunities to heal and thrive and send a strong message to the Rajapaksa war criminals that they will be held to account and that Canada will not stand back. Thank you. Thank you to, to all the speakers and with that, um, we can open it up to questions. Perfect. We will start with questions on Zoom. I will ask participants on Zoom if they have a question to raise your hand using the raise hand function. Si vous avez une question, vous pouvez utiliser la fonction « Levez la main ». Again, if you do have a question, please just use the « Raise hand » function on Zoom, and we will be able to ask your question. We don't have any questions. Oh, we do have a question. And it is Verubin from the Tamil Guardian. Go ahead. You may just have to unmute yourself. So in responding to, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Take that as a yes. Brilliant. Okay. So in responding to um, the current crisis, um, I know that uh, uh, I know that there have been a, uh, the U.S. has imposed sanctions on Savendra Silva. Who else uh, from the military establishment uh, beyond the uh, beyond the Rajpaksas should also face sanctions? So the uh, purpose today, uh, Ruben, is to um, ask the Canadian government to impose sanctions, uh, in particular on Gotabaya Rajapaksha and Mahinda Rajapaksha. And there's a particular reasoning for the timing, as you know. Um, there's a new uh, president in place uh, who's uh, very well connected to the Rajapaksha regime. Uh, it is uh, no secret that the uh, Rajapaksha um, family assisted with uh, Ranul Vikramasinghe's um, ascension to power. Um, and given that a cabinet will be sworn in uh, of ministers very shortly, I think it's imperative that Sri Lanka move forward uh, and leave behind its legacy of war criminals as uh, government officials uh, over uh, its future. Um, and therefore, the timing of this is particularly important. And, and at this juncture, uh, while there are a number of others that, that could very well be on a list, including Shavindra Silva, um, the call today uh, from myself is, uh, is, is to uh, ensure that in a timely manner, we impose sanctions on both Mahinda Rajabaksha and Gotabaya Rajabaksha with, of course, others who um, are credibly alleged to have been part of um, the end of the um, armed conflict in 2009, uh, who are alleged to have committed war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, uh, to uh, also be included in these sanctions. But our primary focus today is on the Rajavaksha brothers. And if anyone else wants to add. For Ruben, do you have a follow-up? Oh, apologies, I can unmute myself. Um, no, no follow-up. Thank you for uh, that response. That makes um, a great deal of sense. Thank you. We have no further questions on Zoom, if there's anything else you'd like to add. No, I want to thank um, all the panelists for joining us today in, uh, in uh, such short notice, and I want to thank uh, everyone in, in attendance, as well as... Uh, Parliamentary Media Bureau for their assistance today. Thank you. This concludes the press conference. So 
Thank you, Vinod, Farida, and uh, Archana. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you.